Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on Off-Campus Living 101. We're very glad that you've joined us. While people are logging in, I'll just give you some um, guidelines for how we will proceed tonight. So this is a very important note. We want you to know that um, Tulane University and the Office of Parent Programs and the departments represented by our panelists can't endorse or recommend any specific apartments, landlords, neighborhoods, or other businesses related to off-campus housing. But we put this webinar together to give you a compilation of resources so students and parents can investigate these options for off-campus housing with more knowledge and background as you approach this process. So we hope you'll keep that in mind. And um, I'll just tell you that your microphones are muted and chat is disabled. We would ask you to hold your questions until we prompt you to type them in and just use the Q&A feature in your controls to submit the questions and we'll let you know when we get to that point. The link to a recording of the video, the, the video recording of the webinar will be posted in a few days on the Parent Programs website um, under the webinars and tutorials um, tab. And you'll also get an email with that link and some additional information to help you in this um, process. So um, look for that email um, in a couple of days with the webinar link. So here is the outline for what we'll address this evening. And um, so we're gonna cover a lot of ground, but we wanna do that early, but quickly. So we leave a good amount of time for your questions. So I'm happy to be joined by my colleagues who are panelists tonight from several different areas of campus. So Lauren Jardell, who's the Director of Local Government and Community Relations is here. Kyle Rice joins us. She's the Associate Director for Housing Operations within the Department of Housing and Residence Life and Erica Woodley, who's our Dean of Students. So I'll just moderate the questions at the end, and I'm happy to turn things over to my colleagues. So here we go. Hi, good evening. Um, so one of the first things we're gonna cover is just a general understanding of the uptown real estate market. And as many of you may know already, New Orleans um, does not have many large apartment complexes. Unlike other cities with colleges and universities, uh, New Orleans has very few large multi-unit complexes. Um, most of the units around campus are what's known as a shotgun double, or you might have larger houses that are converted into multi-unit. And by multi-unit, they're generally about four units or fewer. Um, complex uh, residences. So um, they are owned in a variety of ways. Some of them are managed. On the other side of the unit for rent, um, some of them might be owned by out of town uh, developers or um, owners, or maybe even by parents of former students. So um, you have a a mix of who you're dealing with and working with in the market here. Um, one thing to really be um, cognizant of as your student begins their search or is um, proceeding in their search is there's been a trend here in New Orleans around the uptown area of converting um, houses into many dormitories or dormitory-like living situations. Um, this is known locally as doubles to dorms. It's um, a trend that has been fought um, pretty uh, success successfully by the neighbors. Um, the town of carrolltonwatch.org, that link that's listed on the slide um, actually is a compilation of properties in the university area and some of the surrounding areas um, that neighbors have compiled of properties that have been bought and converted and that might be of questionable status. Now, this trend, while it has continued and students are living in some of these, um, we're bringing it to your attention really for two reasons. One, um, some of these uh, residences that have become doubles to dorms 
may not be finished. Um, they might still be in some sort of um, permit stall or litigation even. Um, so be very careful if your child is looking at one of these. You know, you want to make sure that it, at a minimum it's ready to live in um, and that construction is finished. Another thing with these, um, and the city council just passed a final ordinance today, uh, limiting, trying to limit the development of these by linking the number of bedrooms with um, the need for off street parking. Uh, as many of you might be aware, a lot of the houses in general in New Orleans, especially this area of New Orleans, do not have off street parking. Um, so in trying to tie new bedrooms with the need for off street parking spaces, the city council is hoping to limit the development of these. But um, also, you should be aware that it is illegal in New Orleans for more than four unrelated people to live. We're letting you know this because this is something that's come up in recent years as doubles to dorms have proliferated. Um, that you know, parents and students are not aware of this. Um, this is something that is hard for the city to enforce, but you should just be aware that it is. Uh, a law on the books. Um, something else uh, we do provide and we'll be mailing out over winter break, the off-campus living guide. Um, it is currently online. We'll provide an updated copy um, to sophomores, uh, students who are currently sophomores. And as I just said, it will be mailed out over winter break and it will be received uh, or mailed to their um, permanent home address. So um, hopefully you'll have a chance to go over that with your student um, before the end of that recess. Um, you know, this guide is, it covers a lot of ground, but you know, one of the things that's most important when your student is looking into their housing options for next Lauren. Lauren, you froze for just a second. Could you back up a couple of sentences? Uh, sure. So uh, the guide covers a lot of topics. Um, you know, it covers everything from where to search to, um, you know, how to search. And I know Erica is going to go over more of that. But, you know, something to really consider is the need to balance um, your students' independence with responsibility. Um, it is a responsibility to live off campus. You know, students, uh, tenants are held responsible for the state of um, a property as much as a landlord is. And the city has in the past and will continue to um, potentially fine and cite students for, you know, things like illegal trash, um, disposal or noise issues. So um, that's something that you should be aware of that they are as responsible as a landlord. Um, I think that I'm going to kind of wrap it up right now and let uh, I think Kyle go forward. All right, thanks, Lauren. So um, we know that our um, rising third and fourth year students have options for where they want to live on campus, and so I just want to talk briefly about um, on campus housing. Uh, so our students are required to live on campus for their first two years. Um, and then after that, they have the option of living on or off campus. Um, so in a couple of slides, we'll talk about uh, what the process is for students that um, would like to apply to live on campus and important dates they need to know in regards to their housing contract, um, cancellation fees, and those implications. Um, but one thing that um, I do want to make sure is really clear um, to parents is that housing is not guaranteed for third and fourth year students. Um, so while they are welcome to apply, uh, we do have to some years limit the number of um, spaces on campus for those students so that we can ensure we're meeting our obligation to our first and second year students. So um, given what we know about next year and our current um, class that's going to be our second year students, uh, we do know that we will have um, some availability, but not an abundance of availability for rising juniors and seniors, um, and that we are encouraging them to plan to live off campus. Um, but for our students that do still want to apply for on-campus housing, our next slide is going to detail 
um, what that will look like. So very shortly after students return for spring um, or from winter break, they will begin the application process for the 2022-23 school year. Um, they would need to apply by February. Um, and there's a lot of different things that happen in that process. Most notably that in early March, they will begin putting together roommate groups. Um, and then our rising junior and senior students will select their housing on March 16th and 17th. Um, a student is welcome to apply for housing. And then if they have found off-campus housing in the interim, um, they don't have to select uh, in a, a room on March 16th or 17th. They are welcome to cancel their application with no penalty or choose not to select um, if they have alternative housing at that point. Um, additionally, in April, we will uh, have some wish lists, but any juniors or seniors that do not have the opportunity to select because we have hit our maximum number of juniors or seniors on campus um, will be added to a, a non-guaranteed wait list um, that we will go to should space become available. So that is how that process works. Um, we're not going to go into a ton of um, detail on that process, so we'll be happy to answer Q&A and the reason for that. Um, on your next slide, you'll see a couple links here. Um, we will have a returning student room um, selection process um, FAQ, which will be updated on our website very soon. We will also have another parent webinar specifically about that process to kind of go into many, many more details, but we know that that's not why all of our parents are here tonight. Um, so I would encourage you to check that out. Um, if your student is predominantly focused on living on campus, we'll address way more of those process questions at that time and at these resources. Um, but for students that um, are unsure yet of where they plan to live um, and may put in a housing application, um, I do wanna draw folks to some important deadlines. Um, and so this is the um, cancellation terms and conditions that students uh, agree to when they apply for on-campus housing as part of their agreement. Um, so, so the biggest thing that we want students to know is if they apply for housing and they select a room, um, if they choose to cancel that after having picked a room, they are um, accountable for the cancellation fees in the contract. Um, and so if a student were to move out after they take an occupancy of a room, there are additionally prorated charges for the days they were in the room. But even if a student cancels prior to move in, there are still associated fees. Those fees can be found on our next slide here. Um, so like we said, students will select rooms in late March. Um, we give them through April, uh, before April 1st, there's a, a cancellation free window um, in which students can change their mind and cancel their housing. Um, and then after that, we have a graduated fee schedule that um, follows the academic calendar um, fee schedule for students that are canceling. Um, these are the proposed dates for 22-23. Um, like I said, they are based on the academic calendar and as the academic calendar changes, those fees may also change. Um, any changes to these dates um, after student contracts have been signed will be emailed to students so that they are aware of any contract changes. And now I think we're going to talk about um, a little bit more about what it means to live off campus. And I think that might be my cue. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Erica Woodley. I'm the Dean of Students. Um, and, you know, I'm going to talk through uh, some things that your students are probably considering now and what things that they should be considering um, as they prepare to, to move off campus. Some folks have already moved down this road very quickly. Um, you know, I think every year uh, the, the landlords locally put more and more pressure on students to sign leases early. Um, and that's challenging when we get that. Um, so one of the things that, that I see every year uh, are students who want to live with like every person they've ever met at Tulane. Um, and, you know, to Lauren's point earlier, they are really only supposed to live with four people in a unit. Um, and when landlords don't abide by that, it, it actually ends up creating problems for the students um, around things like garbage and, and basic kinds of, um, you know, 
public service stuff and parking and, and those kinds of things. So it's really good if they can kind of stick to that number and, and make sure that, you know, everyone who's living with them um, <laughs> is going to be a great roommate. That's, that's easier said than done, I realize. Um, you know, I think it is important for students to understand that when they sign a lease with someone, um, you know, they're going to be with that person um, for the next year. Uh, and that, that if there are conflicts or conflicts arise, they're going to have to work through them. Um, another thing that, that challenges students uh, is the, the idea of having to communicate with folks um, who do things like, you know, fix their apartments or um, turn on their power. And, you know, a lot of students have parents who assist with that. Um, but it's it's something that, you know, they really need to sort of think through. And, and it's great experience for them to actually navigate it on their own with your support. Um, but it's not always easy. And, and I've, I've been in New Orleans for almost 20 years now. And I can say New Orleans has a special nuance around some of this stuff that, that makes it even trickier. Um, the, the third bullet point is actually something that, um, you know, I really hope that you all will take the time to talk to your students about. Um, we are, are located in a, a, a very nice residential neighborhood. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of, of different kinds of neighbors. We have, you know, students who are neighbors, people who work at the university who are neighbors, people who have absolutely nothing to do with the university and have very strong feelings about the university, um, you know, as neighbors. And then we have a lot of folks who are really reasonable um, and just want our students to, to treat them with respect and, you know, be kind of respectful neighbors. And, uh, you know, I would say 80% of the time, that's what they get, but 20%, um, you know, of the time we kind of miss the mark and, and we hear about that in, in major ways and it has a really significant impact on kind of the goodwill of the community for us. Um, the next thing is, you know, just when you move off campus, I think the the idea of, of everything being kind of at your disposal as it is when you're on campus, it you just have to factor in a little more, a little more consideration about that kind of thing. Um, and, and the other things like, you know, who's going to take out the trash and who's going to clean the bathrooms, those things you have to sort of think through with, with the people that you're living with. Go to the next slide, Benny. Um, so most of our students have never signed leases before. Um, and uh, there's also this phenomenon. And I, I think I, I was at a, an appointment, like I'm part of a research study for COVID and I was, they gave me this informed consent packet that was like 30 pages. And I, I think I read like half of the first page and then the last page and signed it. And then I thought about what I actually had just done and went back through. But, you know, I think for, for students, the lease agreements are, are over, overwhelming and they don't exactly know what they're looking for. And so talking to your student about that um, is important before they sign it. Um, there are, you know, certain things you want to make sure they're aware of, like what's the security deposit? How do you go about getting it back? Um, what's included, who takes care of the yard, what are the expectations. Um, and I think, you know, you guys can play a really important su supporting role in that. Um, I, I do think it's good if you take a look at, at the lease before your student signs it. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think the other, the other thing to remember is that, or to remind them is that uh, if some, so we have students who will go see a property and the landlord will say, yeah, you know, before you move in, we're going to do all of this stuff and they'll tell them this when they're walking around the property with them and you know maybe things like change the locks or paint paint the place or fix something and then the student comes to move in and, and that actually isn't happening and um, it hasn't happened and so you know it's important to make sure that they understand that if someone tells them something um, verbally it's not really it's not super effective and so they should try to get all of that stuff in writing along with a plan for when it's going to be done um, this year in particular, we had a lot of students who committed to properties that were um, under construction. And then, you know, as, as it, it happens with construction, sometimes things get delayed. And um, we had a lot of students who arrived with no place to live because their apartment was still very much under construction. So, you know, make sure that they understand. And, and I think you could even say, you know, try not to sign a lease for a property that you couldn't move in right when you see it. Um, it's a good kind of rule of thumb. Um, we have a great resource at Tulane called the Tulane Legal Assistance Program or TULAP. Um, and, and it's basically a program um, with, you know, 
first and third year law students who work under the under the direction of a civil, we also have a criminal side of this, but that's not really relevant for this, the civil, a, a civil attorney who, um, who helps them kind of advise students. So they can take their lease there to be reviewed. Um, and if they have problems along the way, this is a good resource for them um, in terms of, you know, like if they, if they um, have in writing that their landlord's gonna do all this stuff and then the landlord doesn't do it. Or, um, you know, we've had issues with landlords, um, you know, doing things that are, that are sort of creepy or, you know, changing the terms that this group can be a helpful resource to students and it's it's the basic consultation is free of charge for them and it's right by campus it's a few blocks away um and so you know make a note of this uh it's it's a useful thing we it became an especially handy after um hurricane ida this year uh there were lots of of issues that were uh, you know for instance we had some landlords who were saying they had to cancel the lease because there was damage and then they would repair the damage and put the the property right back on the, the market, which they're not actually supposed to do. So having two lap around was really helpful during that time. And I think it continues to be relative to issues around that. So I think it's important when you, you know, when your students going through this process to really let them kind of work through this, this process. So, you know, what, what is, give them, what is their budget? Um, and, you know, not everyone, um, has the same kind of budget considerations. And so help them understand like what the real cost of living off campus is. Um, this is important because at some point, you know, they're gonna be completely independent and have to, and some of them might be now. And so this is a really important exercise to, to go through um, just to make sure that, you know, they understand, um, you know, it's important to have a little money for a rainy day fund in case something happens and you have to, to relocate, you know, for the night. You don't ever wanna be in a situation where you feel like you don't have anywhere to go. Um, and so I think, you know, helping them understand that uh, is important. The other thing that I really, really, really want to highlight um, is renter's insurance. Uh, it's, a, it's not an expensive policy. Uh, and, you know, this year, particularly it's on, on our minds because of Hurricane Ida, but, but truly it's something that kind of regardless of where you live, you should, you should consider renter's insurance because the deductible tends to be a lot lower than someone's homeowner's insurance. And, um, you know, I think the, the, the good thing about it is um, it covers a lot of other things. So it, depending upon the policy, they can cover things like if, if your student's bike gets stolen from the front yard or, you know, something gets taken from their apartment um, all the way to, you know, kind of damage from a hurricane or, or other kind of natural disaster, fires, that kind of thing. Um, and so I really... It, it's not a significant investment and it, it you know, if you needed it, it, it is significant. And we had a number of students this year who had it, who were, who were able to, to use it without issue. Um, the other thing to think about, and this again, because of Ida is, is kind of front of mind for me, um, emergencies and, you know, what it means to, to be here in a city that, that is hit by hurricanes sometimes and, and what the plan looks like for your student. And I will tell you, you know, the university makes decisions about when we go and when we stay. As, as families, you are welcome to have your student evacuate when you want them to, be, to evacuate. You're also welcome to, to help them understand what it means to shelter in place. Um, you know, I think for us, the, the, the positive piece of, of kind of negotiating your independence and living off campus with friends is, is important. Um, but it doesn't come without some cost, and the costs are things like this, where you know we we need them to to be safe, and we need them to understand kind of the responsibility of of all of this. Um, and then I think the other kinds of emergencies that we were talking about here are just things that come up. Um, you know, sometimes um, you may have like damage to your apartment that displaces you. And what I would love to say is that the landlord will cover that for you, but that's not um, not all landlords are created equal. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit more at the end. <laughs> um, when they're looking for for places, I think this everyone's panicking about um, apartments right now, and and I get it. Um, you know, I think the in New Orleans, it's it's even trickier uh, because a lot a couple of blocks off campus, I think, can be 
can feel very far. And people always list apartments and say, you know, it's it's right by Tulane and Loyola. And then you you actually like do the distance and it's it's not right by Tulane and Loyola. It's like in the same city, but it's not actually right by. And so you really, you know, you have to make sure that you're um, that you're aware of of where the place is and that they feel that the place is an appropriate distance from campus. Um, if I'm if I'm a person who's on the uptown campus, I'm gonna want to want it to be walkable, um, honestly, because the the especially if it's the first year living off campus. Um, the other benefit of that is, you know, you'd be within TUPD's perimeter, which I feel is is important um, as your as students are starting to navigate that kind of transition. Um, and you know how you're gonna get to and from. Like I said, I would I would try to go with something that's walkable. Um, and most things, you know, most things are, um, most of the properties that our students rent tend to be, you know, fairly close. I think when they get to be seniors and in, in you know, graduate or four plus one programs, sometimes they do want to live in um, kind of the hipper parts of, of town, but uh, I sounded like a 300 year old woman when I said that. But anyway, um, the other thing to, to look at is the, the crime map data that NOPD puts out. Uh, you know, I would be, I would be, um, look for things that, you know, there, there are petty crimes everywhere. Look for things that are, that are really kind of deal breakers. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that happens that TUPD will do after a student's in a lease, they'll, they'll do a security assessment and just let you know kind of what they think about, about the, the property. So um, this is important. I had a, a student a few years ago who was in an apartment group of students and the apartment caught on fire and thankfully they weren't there um or maybe one was there but um and got out safely but what what we found afterwards is that they had two doors that were basically um stuck shut and so there was really one good exit out of the apartment which is not safe and so these guys will come in and, and take a look at it um take a look at the property and give you recommendations um i also am a big fan of ring doorbells uh, i think just from a total security perspective in terms of, you know, you don't just open your door to anyone, you kind of know who's there. I think those are a good investment. And if the landlord's not willing to do it, I think, you know, it's a good idea for parents to, or students to, to pay on their own because it's, it's, it's worth it. Um, this is a map. Uh, and I think, you know, you can, you can see um, the area that, that Tulane is in the 70118. So if you're uptown, that's the uptown campus. Um, you know, when you're looking at, at properties online, you can see the, the zip code of the address and you can see how far away it can get pretty quickly. But the even the 70118 area code is pretty, pretty wide. Um, so how do people find apartments? Um, we're actually working on something to, to make that a little easier. Um, hopefully we'll be there soon, but we're not quite there. Uh, a lot of folks, I think that probably the number one way is word of mouth. They know someone older who lives somewhere and, and they're kind of passing down the lease. Um, but they're also sign, people put up yard signs. That's, I know that sounds silly, but they're walking by these properties and they see them. Um, another way is the two-lane classifieds. Um, be careful with the two-lane classifieds. It's called the two-lane classifieds, but it's actually not affiliated and you don't have to be affiliated with Tulane to, to be on the Tulane classifieds. Um, I have had students find roommates there that have been not ideal. And so, you know, I would be really careful about that and make sure the person is actually a Tulane student um, if you're doing, if you're considering that. Um, but also, um, you know, make sure that a property, when you look at a property online and you see pictures of it, make sure that that job, that that is actually the thing. Like when you look it up, that it matches. Um, there are some rental agencies, uh, in, in the uptown area, some property management companies that, that help students find apartments. Um, those are not all created equal either. And so, you know, when, if you, if you use that kind of service, make sure you're, you're asking some questions on the front end about, um, you know, what they look, what, what the service looks like. I also think, um, and everybody, you know, I think this is pretty clear that the Tulane parents Facebook page gives a lot of information. Um, not always, um, you know, not 100% of the time is it accurate, but some of the, some of this information can be helpful. And I think the other thing, you know, just Google, 
um, particularly landlords. Google the name of the landlord, um, and you can you can pretty quickly get a sense of, you know, what kind of person the, the landlord is. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, I think students tend to get really panicked when they when things don't work out right away or when they don't, you know, this they don't already have housing for next August in you know November. Um, just remind them to be patient and not to, you know, to, to find the right thing for them, not to, you know, not to feel like they have to, to sign the first lease they see. All right, thank you, Erica. Um, again, Lane Government Relations website, and that's included later in the presentation. But this, Lauren, you're freezing a little bit, so and you can start over. Okay. <laughs> so the off off campus living guide is available online at the Tulane Government Relations website. That is provided later in the presentation uh, on a later slide. But the guide does provide a lot of the information um, that Erica briefly covered um, and that I'm covering. Um, one. The neighborhoods surrounding campus are full of a diverse group of people. It's not just students. Um, and you know, it's everything from young professionals and young families to elderly um, people who've lived in their homes for you know, upwards of 30, 50 years. Um, and they all want and hope to have a high quality of life. So when things like trash and noise um, get out of hand, we definitely hear about it um, and the neighbors are the neighbors that are vocal are very vocal and they have no problem contacting council members and the Lauren you're frozen the last thing we heard you say was neighbors don't hesitate to contact council members, our city council members. So folks, we know that Lauren's been having some connectivity issues. I can hop in, Penny, Okay, if Great. she comes back. Um, and so, you know, I think her point was, um, our neighbors are vocal and they reach out to, to city government officials to complain about students. They read out, reach out to us to complain about our students. Um, and often, you know, we, we are located right next to Loyola and we'll say, I'll say, well, how do you know they were Tulane students? And then they'll send you a video of someone with a two-lane shirt doing whatever they were alleging was being done. And so, you know, we are aware of the fact that, um, you know, not all of our students are good neighbors, but we really are striving to, to improve that because um, it creates it creates ill will. Um, and it's not just about, you know, it's not just about how in the neighborhood. It, it, it really colors the impression of people around Tulane and, and Tulane students. And, and it's disheartening because our students are, are largely like amazing. Um, and then the other thing is, um, and this is true kind of no matter what, but the code of conduct applies um, even when you're off campus. And so, you know, if you if you do something and a neighbor reports it, we're gonna put you through our conduct system. Um, noise is another thing that, that comes up a lot. Um, you know, students will have, you know, a, a bunch of people over. And the other thing Lauren didn't mention about some of the newer properties is that they're not exactly insulated in the way that that's that's great. Um, and so you may be really close to another neighbor and, you know, the the neighbor complains about, you know, you bouncing a basketball at, at 1 a.m. And so as much as we can, um, we really encourage our students to to meet their neighbors and to, to, you know, to establish a relationship. So if something comes up, they're calling the student directly and, and addressing the issue and they can handle it you know, kind of civilly like neighbors do, um, instead of calling us. Uh, that doesn't always happen, but it's really, it's really the ideal. Um, and so the biggest issues that, that I think I hear from neighbors are things around kind of just disorderly conduct, um, but trash, and, and trash is difficult because it, we're having some issues with trash pickup in the city currently, but, um, you know, the every, every, um, let's say they get a, a twice a week pickup and, and you have four people living in a, um, in a unit or eight people living in a unit and they have, you know, one trash receptacle, that's not going to do it, right? And so 
it ends up overflowing and then there's trash everywhere and neighbors are really unhappy and they're not unhappy with the person they should be unhappy with who is actually the landlord and um, they get unhappy with our students and so you know on the front end you want to make sure that there's there's an appropriate amount of of um waste receptacles allotted and i think that's hard for students and and i understand the, the complication but i think they they can ask those kinds of questions of their landlord um and then the other thing noise is the last one and i think you know people there's all the way from noise because of parties and loud music but there's also just noise like you know people walking outside and talking um for our students you know 2 a.m isn't super late for me 2 a.m is almost time to get up in the morning and so you know i think that is um something that that just to remind them about. I think that's it. Lauren, did you, I think we covered um, your content um, for you, Lauren, but um, sure. it's time, great. It's time now for parents to type in your questions and um, then I'll review those and present them to our panelists. So we have a couple of questions already. Um, and this would go to Kyle. So could you remind um, the participants, when would a student be notified that they definitely have an on-campus room for their junior year if they go through that selection process? Sure. So students that go through returning student room selection actually choose their specific room. Um, so they will know on junior and senior room selection day whether they've gotten a room or not. Um, and that is March 16th and 17th. Um, if a student doesn't select or doesn't have an opportunity to select and end up on that non-guaranteed wait list, um, there's no, there's no re real telling when we might be able to circle back to offer them rooms, if at all, depending on that year's occupancy. Okay, Kyle, so we have another couple of questions for you. Um, is on-campus housing provided for the students who attend the summer business minor program? Um, any student can apply for summer housing uh, in terms of what specifically is covered in the fees for the summer business minor. I would encourage students to reach out directly to that program. And then what about students who plan to study abroad for one semester? Sure. I think so it's, oh, are you talking about on campus or off campus? Penny. So if the person who submitted that could maybe you can well um, we can answer both Kyle you answer yeah. the on campus and then I'll answer the off campus sure um so for our students who are studying abroad in the spring they are welcome to apply for 22 23 housing um and then they will want to cancel their spring housing we'll send an email reminder and we get lists of all the students enrolled in study abroad to remind them to cancel we do not charge cancellation penalties for students that are um, enrolled in a two-lane study abroad program because we don't want to penalize a student for that amazing opportunity. Um, for students that choose to study abroad in the fall, they are welcome to apply for spring-only housing in the fall, um, but that is based on availability um, and is not guaranteed, just like fall. Um, and for off-campus, I would say they have a couple of options. Um, you know, one would be um, uh, for whatever reason, it seems like more of our students go abroad in the fall than in the spring. Um, and so if your students going abroad in the fall, um, one of the things that they're, you know, they can sign a lease and then try to find a subletter for the fall. Um, and I have not heard of people having difficulty finding subletters. It's usually, it usually happens pretty easily because we have transfer students and other people who are coming in that don't really know anybody and they're looking for that. or you have folks who didn't, you know, didn't really make housing arrangements and are kind of panicking at the last minute. Um, and so I haven't had a lot of issues with that. I will say, you know, you want to make sure the, the lease allows subletting and you also want to make sure that your student is is kind of vetting the person that they're they're allowing to sublet. I would not sublet to anyone outside the Tulane community um, for a lot of reasons, you know, but um, the other option would be they could sublet. They could be the person who sublets. And I think that is also you know, it's got some challenges around it, but it is um, a lot of our students do it. And it's really, you know, they have to work within their networks, I think, in order for that to be um, successful. So one of the questions is um, about whether I'll be sending this um, slide deck out. And so, yes, the PDF of the slides will be sent to everybody who registered and 
posted in the parent programs um, webinar archive next week. So the next question is whether the students are receiving the same presentations. So we did say that students, your students were welcome to join with you, although we know that tomorrow's their last day before the, the Thanksgiving break. And so you're welcome to share this with them and watch it together while they're home. Um, it'll be on the parent programs website, um, but there may be something else that'll be provided for students in the um, spring semester, but we wanted to get this out there to parents now because we have heard that there's been more pressure from local landlords on people and that people are starting to get anxious about searching. So we wanted to arm you with this information before your student was going to be home for the different breaks so that you could have a family conversation about some of this. We've also done this presentation for several years for students um, in person and haven't had um, really much interest from students in attending. And I think, you know, part of that is, um, I don't, they don't really want to, I mean, you know, they kind of think they know and they're hearing from their friends and they think they have it all kind of figured out. So we thought this might actually be a better avenue to get some of this information to them through you. So we're kind of using you in that way. Yes, absolutely. Um, so please, please do share this information, have a conversation with your student. Um, Another question is how easy or hard is it to acquire a two lane parking permit for a student who's too far away to walk or take the streetcar? So in the information that I'm gonna send you after the webinar, um, there I've included information about the parking permits for commuters. So it's, it's not that it's hard to get a parking permit. It just may be that it could be difficult at different times of the day or different days of the week to find a lot of parking available. Um, and so students just will kind of learn like everybody else does what time to get arrive and you know to find the most parking spaces um, you know available. So I feel um, like it's also true that you know there there is always parking. It just might not be kind of where they want it to be or right up front. <laughs> may not be right next to the building that they're going to for yeah. the class, but they can find parking at the the parking garage or the um, the lot on Claiborne. So um, next question is we appreciate the comments like don't panic in November about finding an off-campus option since it seems like many students are doing that. Can you advise about what a reasonable timeline should look like? It seems as if waiting until mid-March to know if a student has an on-campus option may make it too late to find a good option. So, you know, help, you know, kind of give some yeah. more context. Yeah. I, I will say, I think this is a moving target and I'm not sure we have a good answer to that. Um, I don't think, you know, I think it's it's true that, um, you know, some people haven't even listed their properties yet. There's There are new properties coming up all the time, but I think, you know, it is also true that we had properties that were damaged during Ida that are offline completely now. And so I wouldn't wait too long. You know, I think at the, at the beginning of the year, it's important to start really looking. Um, but I, I don't know that, and I don't know that March is too late. I think you know, what we see in the past, like June, July is, is hard, um, but anything before that is is pretty good. I think given the, the kind of shifting dynamic, I would, I would aim for something more like April, March, April, kind of on the late side. And so, you know, as long as you sort of have it locked down by then, you know, I think you'll be okay. But again, there's an unknown factor here. We haven't been through a cycle um, like this. So there's another question about what typical rent costs are for the area. I'm not sure if we can give the best answer to this because they are kind of all over the place, but um, if anybody on the panel wants to take a stab, I've got some ideas, but um, that's something else that you can ascertain by looking at those um, Facebook ads and things like that, just to even get a sense of the range and some of the rental agencies uptown also have some listings sometimes. So sometimes you may wanna, even before you start seriously looking, you may wanna just take a, a, a look um, just to see the range of rent prices. There's also a big variety in that. And, and it depends also on how you, you, know, you wanna do it. I have two students right now who live in an off-campus apartment um, and share a room. Um, it's a two bedroom, but they, there are three people who live in it and they 
two of them share a room and so their rent is is significantly less than the other person's rent and so you know i think there are ways to do it to to meet your budget you just have to kind of know your budget and and what that's going to look like so um if you still have other questions then please type them in we're getting to the end of our time um it is really something we can't um predict on, in terms of like percentage of students who live on or off campus um, until really it all shakes out. And so, you know, those kinds of percentages are just aren't something we can share that give you any realistic information right now. So the main thing, the main takeaway, I think that we want you to have is that we're encouraging rising juniors and seniors to begin looking for off campus housing, knowing that most of them will live off campus. So we want you to be armed with this information so that you can feel prepared for that process of looking. Do any of our panelists have any last comments that you want to make? Anyone? Okay, then I think we'll wrap up now and I'll just remind you that this um, information will be um, sent to you and posted if you want to um, take down any of this information right now. You can do that briefly, but it's really kind of um, long, um, complicated URLs there. So I would say just wait until you receive this by email or look it up online. Again, it would be at parents.tulane.edu under the communications and webinars tab. But um, we'll send this to you and we hope that you have a great evening and that you have, if your student is um, coming home for the break, that you have a great um, time with your student and they get some rest and get refreshed for the last part of the semester. So we'll say good night and thank you so much for your participation and your interest. If you have any feedback about this webinar or suggestions for other topics, then please email me at parents at tulane.edu. And if you want to reach out to one of these contacts and you don't remember the information, you're always welcome to email me at parents at tulane.edu and I'll forward that on to the appropriate contact on campus. So thanks to all of our panelists. We appreciate your time and effort this evening. And thank you, parents. Good night. <laughs>